Thank you for joining this edition of CMEO Cast entitled Managing Your MS Patients in the Era of COVID-19. Dr. Fred Lublin has been kind enough to share his thoughts and insights with us today. Dr. Lublin is Saunders Family Professor of Neurology and Director of the Corinne Goldsmith Dickinson Center for Multiple Sclerosis at the Icon School of Medicine in New York, New York. Our learning objective for today's CMEO cast is to optimize care of patients with MS during the COVID-19 era. Welcome, Dr. Lublin. Nothing has been more on the mind of clinicians of all specialties all around the world than this pandemic of COVID-19. It's changed our existence in many ways. And the group that's been most involved with this, of course, are the first-line people who are caring for the patients with COVID-19. Um, they've been heavily involved. This has changed the entire practice of medicine around the world, and certainly here in the United States. And I'm going to discuss some of the aspects of that. So here are some key facts about COVID-19. It is a coronavirus. There are hundreds of coronaviruses. They circulate amongst various animals, and they sometimes can jump at the humans. This occurred with the SARS epidemic of 2002 to 2004, the MERS epidemic of 2012, and COVID-19 that we're now seeing, which is believed to have jumped the humans from an animal, is caused by a virus called SARS-CoV-2. The clinical presentation is up primarily a respiratory infection, both upper respiratory and lower respiratory tract infections, characterized by fever and a dry cough. Also, fairly commonly, early on, is a loss of taste and smell, and this is fairly characteristic um, for this virus. It can also have GI symptoms and body aches and fevers particularly, uh, impressive. Uh, it can lead to lymphopenia, reduction in lymphocytes, and to a bilateral pneumonia that has some characteristic features. In severe cases, there's a development of acute respiratory distress syndrome, ARDS. Now, there's two phases to the, the illness. The first is the infectious phase. The second is the immune response to that. And so what's happened with COVID-19 is that it's producing a marked immune response, which causes this respiratory distress syndrome. We think it's due to a cytokine storm, which is overproduction of cytokines. But there's also disseminated intravascular coagulation. Uh, a lot of blood clots have been associated with this. Uh, encephalitis is rare. Um, it's a little hard to get a full handle on what the neurologic complications of the virus are because these individuals, when they develop these severe side effects, are so sick, they're on respirators, uh, they're sedated, and so it's very hard to get good handle on what's happened to their uh, central or peripheral nervous system. I think as time goes on, we'll be seeing more and more studies uh, analyzing what's actually happened within the central nervous system. Uh, but direct infection appears to be uncommon. The incubation period for the virus has a median of five days and a range from two to 11 and a half days. Uh, and it's already been shown that asymptomatic people uh, can shed virus and uh, therefore can be infectious. Um, and while the, the spread is primarily through droplets, uh, coughing, sneezing, uh, loud speech, uh, it's highly infectious, uh, which is why it's become such a pandemic. So the impact around the world, and, and, and here you see a picture from the, the Johns Hopkins uh, COVID-19 dashboard, which has been a very nice resource keeping track of what's happening. Uh, you can see the total cases, which uh, I'm not sure what the date was. This, oh, this was accessed May 24th, so uh, it has gone up. It's gone up worldwide. Uh, the illness started in 
China. The first country in Europe to be heavily involved was Italy and then Spain. Uh, and then lately, you can see the numbers are still going up in the United States, where we have the most cases, uh, followed by uh, Brazil and Russia, where the numbers are rising quite rapidly. Uh, there is a lot of lethality to this, especially in the older age groups. Uh, and you can see that as well on the Johns Hopkins uh, dashboard. And they have a separate dashboard for the United States where you can look at the uh, incidence uh, of the infection by county in the United States and see where it's waning and where it's rising. Uh, I have to say here in New York City, which was hit extremely hard with this virus, uh, the numbers are going down uh, dramatically, which is a very encouraging sign. And we're hopeful that they will stay down. Uh, this is due primarily to locking down the economy, stay at home orders, social distancing, uh, and the wearing of masks. Um, but no one knows yet what the course of this pandemic is going to be, whether it will be a one-off or whether it will be cyclical or seasonal. So here's a little more about how it is spread. So it's close contact, about six feet, uh, for a period of time. It's transmitted by respiratory droplets from an infected patient. And as I mentioned, uh, an individual can be infected and not necessarily symptomatic at the time that they are spreading the virus. Uh, there's surface uh, issues which aren't entirely clear. It has been shown the virus can live on surfaces, uh, but the infectivity and how long it lives is still under discussion. Uh, but it just suggests that one should be very careful about what one touches and of course, uh, frequent hand washing. During this time, there's been marked changes in, in how we care for patients. So uh, here in New York City, where there was a dramatic uh, epidemic, of this drug, and at Mount Sinai, uh, we took care of thousands of these patients. Uh, we changed from being a multi-specialty hospital to primarily being a COVID hospital converting any unit that could be into an intensive care unit, uh, putting beds into the hospital system. Uh, there was a, a tent hospital set up in Central Park. The Javits Convention Center was converted into a field hospital and the Navy uh, hospital ship Mercy was uh, docked in New York City for a while, all to take care of the, the numbers of patients that did that. And of course, elective procedures were, were uh, put on hold. And in general, and this is a cause for concern, individuals didn't want to come into the hospital. And so one of the things we're going to be looking for as we emerge from this pandemic is caring for those chronic conditions that didn't get cared for um, because patients didn't want to come in the hospital or the hospital couldn't do the type of procedures they wanted to do because of the concerns of bringing individuals in uh, during the uh, pandemic. Uh, in terms of neurologic practice, uh, it changed dramatically for us. We went from doing essentially no telehealth to doing all of our patient visits by telehealth, uh, which actually worked out pretty well and it continues to work out pretty well that we can use various platforms uh, to assess how patients are doing, talk with them, get a history, do aspects of the neurologic examination, and then arrange for whatever studies need to be done. In general, we put off scheduled routine MRI scans, we even delayed some of the infusions to allow the infusion center to have more spacing uh, to be able to see fewer patients, and also because we wanted to keep patients at home and quarantine. Now, what about MS specifically? Well, MS itself doesn't increase the risk of infections unless the patient with MS is significantly disabled uh, and at risk for pulmonary or urinary tract infection. And this is important because, of course, we got many questions uh, from patients about that. Uh, disease modifying therapy, and we're going to talk about because that can affect your susceptibility to infections. 
uh, and this <clears throat> has led to a lot of individualized conversations. But in general, the feeling is that patients who are on immunotherapy uh, for MS should continue on their immunotherapy. And even if they have a mild infection, they should continue. If the infection becomes severe, then we would hold uh, the therapy. Um, and of course, different MS therapies can potentially affect the ability to respond to the virus in, in different ways. So let's take a look at the individual disease modifying medications and how they fit in. Uh, first, we have uh, agents like interferon beta and glutarimer acetate and that are immunomodulators, but don't have a significant effect on the immune system. Interferon beta, in fact, is one of the tools that the body's innate immune system uses uh, to fight off viruses. So we're not very concerned about patients who are already getting that. Glutarimer acetate has such a minimal effect on the immune system that, again, we don't think it's a much concern there. Uh, dimethylfumarate and teraflutamide, to some degree, have immunomodulating properties and could and are associated with some increased risk of infections, uh, but aren't cause for great concern. Of the anti cell trafficking agents, natalizumab, again, shouldn't be a big issue. Uh, it does have the potential to affect trafficking at the central nervous system, uh, but we haven't seen, say, encephalitis or anything of that sort as a major concern. Agents like fingolimode, saponimode, and ozanimode also uh, can affect trafficking. And all of these trafficking agents have a concern that you don't want patients off them too long because of the potential for rebound if they're stopped. Uh, how long they're off will depend on the half-life of the different agents. This will probably include panesimode as well, although that's not yet approved. Of the cell depleting therapies, uh, ocrelizumab is one of interest because anecdotally, we're not seeing it cause a lot of problems in individuals. Uh, Alamtizumab and cladribine a little more immunosuppressive and they could potentially be of, of, of concern. So one wouldn't think about starting individuals on these drugs at this time. How you maintain them depends on whether the individual is very ill or not. Uh, one certainly would not be considering starting bone marrow transplant uh, at this time. At least I think that would be ill-advised except for someone who is in great need of it. So caring for patients with MS during stay-at-home orders. Well, patients are concerned about not being treated and, and about the virus potentially causing exacerbations. That is a theoretical possibility, although we have not seen it as yet. We do want to make sure individuals stay on their medications. Uh, we want them to be careful if they get the infection to get the proper care for that and then make the individual determination as if and when they should stop their disease-modifying therapy. Uh, we have conversations with patients about how to stay isolated, hand washing, wearing a mask, not going out unless it's absolutely necessary, and being careful about what and who comes into the household. Uh, for acute relapses, we treat these with steroids, um, which can increase the risk of infection. Um, so one should screen for symptoms of COVID prior to cortical steroid treatment. It is interesting to note that uh, steroids have been used during the immune activation phase of the infection. Uh, and again, treatment with disease-modifying therapy may need to be delayed. Um, if they have the infection, but one has to be careful about the timing of that delay, especially with any of the agents that could potentially lead to rebound flare-ups. Discussed earlier that telehealth has become a critical aspect in caring for patients with COVID-19 as they stay home-based. Um, we can deal with them. Occasionally, individuals need to come in to be seen in the office or in the ER and I suspect that telehealth will become a part of the new normal. We certainly can use it to triage individuals, review medication adherence, assess their quality of life, stay connected, and also to review with them the precautions on how to avoid uh, COVID infections. Uh, we have been delaying uh, MRI and lab monitoring uh, unless it's absolutely necessary. Again, with the idea of keeping patients uh, as isolated uh, from the virus as possible. 
So SMART goals, we should evaluate patients for COVID-19 symptoms. We should be using telehealth so we can keep people at home. Immunotherapy should be continued in mild infections, recognized that some disease modifying therapies or immunomodulators and others are a little more immunosuppressant. And individualize the therapeutic strategy based on the patient factors, disease factors, and drug factors. Thank you for your attention.